It's a great pleasure to welcome you, Jaburi and Mariana, but also welcome the students. And I have to switch between the camera and the room in order to connect with people from home, from offices, from anywhere around the globe with students from ETH Zurich, which um, are following the course agroecology here at ETH Zurich. And we have incorporated public lectures into the student lecture. So we will have a joint public and not private initiative, but student initiative. And we are very happy to welcome you all here tonight to talk, listen, learn and reflect about agroecology. Let me briefly start with an introduction. Um, I decided not to open the talk with all the challenges which we face within the food system, but start with a global call for action, which are the SDGs, the Global Agenda 2030, with 17 development goals. And these development goals are closely relinked to food systems and sustainable food systems, because food systems do connect to all the different SDGs. And so does also agroecology. Agroecology does connect to food systems and does support also food system transformation to more sustainability. Agroecology, as defined by FAO, is both a scientific discipline, a set of practices, and a social movement. As a science, it studies how different components of the agroecosystem interact. As a set of practice, it seeks sustainable farming systems that optimize and stabilize yields in the long term also. And as a social movement, it pursues multifunctional roles for agriculture, promotes social justice, and nurtures identity and culture. In that sense, it's a very holistic, interesting, but also complex um, theory, concept, thought of thing, uh, way of thinking. Here you find the definition of the HLPE from 2019. And you see in this definition, it reflects nicely also the complexity of agroecology and the different layers which do connect to agroecology. It's about promoting closed cycles. It's about the use of natural processes in producing food, reducing negative externalities and stresses. But it's also important to build on local knowledge, participatory processes, engage different actors within the food system and connect local knowledge with science too. And in that sense, agroecological approaches recognize the connex between social and ecological systems. And that's why it has also come up with different principles from different, um, with different focus. These 13 principles as suggested by the HLPE are a bit the guidance of both the student, but also the public lecture. And we will use and select different principles to talk about. Some do connect to the agroecosystem, Others do connect more to the food system. And we have also different kind of ranges or layers. We are talking about aspects more related to farms or landscapes, but also aspects related to society or communities as such. And furthermore, when we talk about transformation, these different principles do act on different levels of that transformation, being it more at an incremental or more on a transformative level. 
And we want within this lecture series to deep dive a bit into these different element principles. Talk about the principle, talk about the connection to food system transformation and understand where these principles do influence the system and do trigger transformation towards more sustainability. We will have hence a small mini series of lectures in the next weeks, starting today on the topic of biodiversity. You see here the next five, the next four examples too, and you're more in, you're invited to also check out our website. Some of the lectures will be then also put on our website to review or share with others to um, then watch the lecture at a later stage. So in that sense, if you are not able to join us now in the next weeks, every time we will um, provide you a link on this website also for these lectures. The format will be the same for all the five lectures, starting with two inputs. Today we have Jaburi Gazul with us and Mariana Fenzi. After these two inputs, there is time for a short moderated Q&A session. So use the chat function, we collect the questions and then we connect again with the um, contributors of today. And then we will close around one hour after an hour, an hour, we will close this public section and then enter into a debate with the students. So you see it's part, we have an inclusive part and then an exclusive part also for our students here in the lecture hall. Without any further ado, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome both Chaburi and Mariana here today with us. And I would like to uh, give you the floor and ask you to take the opportunity at the beginning to shortly introduce yourself, because um, I'm always a bit afraid when introducing um, speakers, I might focus on the wrong points. So I rather give you the opportunity to say what you think is within this audience most crucial. In that sense, thank you very much for being with us. Also, thank you to the public for being with us. And of course, thank you for the students to be with us. And I'm looking forward to uh, an interesting hour with all of you. Thank you. Javuri, may I ask you to share your screen? Sure. Um, let me see if I can do this. Um, I think you need to give me permission to share the screen. Yes, we will. One second. Co host. Now you should be able to share your screen, Jaburi. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, hopefully, just can you just confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, we see your screen. Perfect. Not um, yet. Good, well, thank you. But yes, now in full view. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and just by way of introducing myself, I'm Jaburi Ghazul, and I'm Professor of Ecosystem Management at ETH Zurich. And the work that we do um, is very much about ecosystem, uh, how, well, how we work with ecosystems given the various threats uh, that they are subject to. And these threats can be uh, from very local scales to global scales. Um, for example, uh, local, local scale deforestation and poor management of, of farmscapes and global scale obviously being things like biodiversity loss and climate change. And we work with farmers and communities um, to better understand the dynamics of agricultural systems. And then we bring in a lot of our own ecological expertise to explore how we can 
uh, better manage those systems for future well-being of people, for food production, for biodiversity and conservation. And we do that across the world from places like India, Africa, um, Southeast Asia, as well as in Europe. Um, what I'm going to be focusing on today, really, because I only have 20 minutes, is um, some of the work we've been doing in India. And I'm going to use the Indian work on coffee agro ecosystems um, to illustrate a number of points relating to biodiversity and the role of biodiversity in, um, in the management and the ecology and conservation of these uh, coffee agroforestry landscapes in southern India. Now, I've titled my talk, uh, Biodiversity in Agriculture, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And for those of you who are kind of more or less my age, which I guess is not very many of you, you will know that The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly is, uh, was a famous Western film with Clint Eastwood, um, and and uh, very much, uh, and I like that title because it emphasizes that biodiversity isn't always good. There are bad aspects of biodiversity that we need to consider, and even ugly aspects. And this will all become clear uh, through the talk that I give. And so, if we're going to really promote the use of biodiversity in 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 agriculture, we need to at least acknowledge and recognize and 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 manage the bad and the ugly aspects of biodiversity. So. Uh, you, um, Martin provided a very, very good uh, introduction and definition of um, uh, what agroecology is. I provide a very simple uh, interpretation of it here, the application of ecological principles to agricultural systems and practices. And that's basically uh, a lot of the work that we do is, is captured by that single sentence. Um, now, Martin sent me a whole bunch of different questions that I could address, and I've chosen just four of them. Uh, the first is what role can agroecology play in food systems in a very general way? And then more specific issues, what makes biodiversity important specifically for agroecology? What are the trade-offs and challenges we face in supporting or promoting biodiversity uh, and its adoption in agroecology? Um, and what role can science, policy, and practice play in overcoming these challenges? And because of limited time, I'll very briefly touch upon these, but hopefully provide lots of um, thoughts for further discussion afterwards. So let me focus on the first point, and this is something I'll, I will very briefly touch on. Um, what is the role of agroecology and, and how might we conceptualize it across um, uh, agriculture and its role in uh, promoting a, a rethinking of how we manage landscapes uh, from very large scale to the farm scale? And I think it is all about scale. I think the role of scale is very important because agroecology and the role of ecology in agriculture is not just about looking at the farm scale. There's lots of really excellent work that is done at that scale, but that scale is not sufficient in itself. Agroecology is much more than that. And Martin's introduction emphasized that. It's about linking two processes that occur at habitat scales within which the farms are set, at whole ecosystem scales, which encompass several different habitats. And then ecosystems occur, uh, multiple ecosystems occur across landscapes. So you can even go beyond this. You can look at regional scales. If we're going to adopt effective agroecological agro management systems, we need to be thinking about this cross-scale approach, the feedbacks between scales, the interdependencies between scales, and how that all affects the, the processes that happen at the local farm scale at which decisions are being made by farmers. And some of the the physical or ecological attributes that are important at these scales include, starting from the larger scale, issues such as climatic variation or water regulation and water flows, uh, soil fertility, all of these vary at these large landscape scales. And we need to think about that if we're going to manage landscapes in an effective way to support biodiversity and long-term resilience of, of agricultural systems and maintain productivity. We need to maintain those systems within, ag within which agricultural systems exist. We need to be thinking about seed dispersal processes, gene flow, roles of disturbance um, and, and resilience. And then coming down to lower scales, nutrient cycling processes, pollination, um, primary production at these local scales, and then things that are directly under the control of farmers and how they manage their, their soil, their, the crops, the trees on their, in their agro um, agroforestry systems, things about thinking about decomposition processes, and nutrient cycling at a very local scale, water infiltration, um, soil integrity, and, and the provision of food, fuel, and fiber. So it's this cross-scale issue that I want to really emphasize is really uh, important. Now, I, I will come back to this briefly by way of introduction, but I want to quickly move on 
to really the core of what I want to talk about. What makes biodiversity important for agroecology? And I want to couple that with a discussion of what are the trade-offs and challenges we face in supporting biodiversity or in adopting agroecology. And this is where the good, the bad, and the ugly come in. Um, and I want to illustrate that through the work we've been doing um, in Southern India, uh, which is a particular region in Karnataka state called Kudugu. And Kudugu is, is shown in the map on the right-hand side. And here's an, and in the image in the bottom left shows what the typical forested landscape looks like in, in Kudugu. Now in the dark green on the map on the left-hand side in the Western um, area of Kudugu, um, there's lots of evergreen forest. On the right-hand side um, in yellow or more or less yellow um, is much more dry forest systems, um, deciduous forests. And then in the middle in the light green is the coffee growing um, uh, landscape. And coffee is still very diverse. It still has a lot of native shade trees, but it is um, undergoing quite substantial change. And that change can be illustrated by um, comparing a map from 1977, which is where this map is, is um, uh, the date of this map, and compare it to what's happening in so 30 years later in 2007. This is from work that was done by the CAFMED project um, in Kudugu. And you can see the dramatic expansion of coffee agroforestry um, across this landscape and the reduction in evergreen forest. Um, which you might argue is not a good thing for conservation and for biodiversity, and that's absolutely true. But so long as the coffee can be managed effectively, a lot of the biodiversity that exists within evergreen forest can still be retained in that coffee landscape. But the issue is, and, and the bottom left-hand corner uh, image now shows um, an area which, where the native forest has been replaced by coffee agroforestry, there's still quite a few trees there that have been retained, but obviously not as many. But the crucial issue is if we're going to retain biodiversity within these landscapes, we need to be thinking at how, how are these coffee uh, agroforests being managed. And there are basically two types. I'm simplifying things a lot, but basically two types. This native tree cover, also called jungle uh, coffee production, which is in the top diagram, where coffee um, in, in the understory is shaded by lots of native trees, which are often remnant trees from the original native forest. This has Typically, in a in a five hectare, uh, one to five hectare uh, coffee agroforest, there could be twenty or more different native tree species uh, providing shade for the coffee. And there's very high biodiversity in these re in these um, agroforests. In contrast, there's exotic tree cover by, in this case, Grevillea robusta, which is a tree introduced from uh, Australia. Uh, all the native trees in this bottom image have been removed and replaced with with Grevillea very low biodiversity, but still quite a productive coffee uh, plantation. So if you imagine there's these two systems, um, the reality is more complex, but let's assume there's these two systems. I'm gonna be talking um, about the benefits or, or disadvantages of these two systems. So what are the benefits? Well, certainly if we retain native trees and all that biodiversity in these um, agroforestry systems, we certainly get benefits in terms of much better pollination, much better natural pest control, which means uh, um, less need to apply pesticides, more effective nutrient cycling processes. And this is what Micah is working on in the picture in the, in the bottom in the middle there. She's one of our old PhD students who's looking at nutrient cycling processes under native shade trees versus under grevillea. And she discovered that nutrient cycling and soil fertility is maintained at a much better level under native shade trees because of the nutrients that come in, the diverse nutrients that come in from the leaf litter of native trees. So that's all good. This long-term nu nu um, effective nutrient cycling and, and the reduced use of uh, fertilizer and pesticides is very good for ag long-term agroecosystem resilience. So that's another big benefit. But also these agroforestry systems, these diverse agroforestry systems provide lots of fruit, honey, and fodder, nuts from the variety of native trees that exist and the variety of, and the success of the, of the honeybees uh, that, that are often the domesticated honeybees that are often introduced into these systems. And the fodder is used to support cattle as well. So lots of diverse benefits. And finally, tourism is a huge um, benefit to local farmers in the region because they often offer homestays where um, citizens from Bangalore or Mysore, some of the big cities not too far away, will come and, and um, stay and go bird watching in these beautiful agroforestry systems where there's still a lot of biodiversity. So these are all the good things. 
But of course, we shouldn't be naive about this. Biodiversity isn't always um, a, a good thing. If it was, farmers would would never have intensified their systems if, if the benefits, if they're all benefits and no costs. So there are costs. And this is where we talk about the bad or the trade-offs associated with biodiversity. The opportunity costs of retaining native forest trees um, is uh, are high. So here on the right hand side, we see a agroforestry system that is where all the native trees have been replaced by grevillea, this exotic species. And here the farmer is gaining the benefit of a fast growing tree that he or she can harvest at a later time for timber and therefore get income from that timber. But you'll see along the stems of these trees, there's a vine that's growing up the stems. That is pepper. And pepper can be grown at much higher densities. Um, the pepper vine can be grown at much higher densities on the stems of these trees and are much easier to handle in terms of harvesting the pepper. And so labor demands and labor costs are much lower. The com combination of grevillea and pepper adds at least 100% value. In other words, it doubles the value um, of the, co that the, the income that the farmer is getting from the coffee estate. So coffee becomes one of several commodities, um, which obviously is a good thing for the welfare and the livelihoods of these farmers. But additionally, um, if you have native shade trees, then the amount of light reaching the understory, the water interception is somewhat more irregular because these native tree species are at very variable densities. They're variable species. They respond in different ways in terms of light penetration, in terms of interception of water. And the result of that is you have very uneven productivity across your coffee estate. Some trees, some coffee bushes produce lots of um, berries, lots of coffee berries, others far fewer, simply because of the nature of the neighboring trees. With grevillea, it's much more uniform uh, and much more predictable. So these are some of the, some of the costs of um, retaining native trees. So what about the ugly? And the ugly I present in terms of some of the real challenges that farmers have to face. And these are all in terms of animal conflicts. Um, so, OK, fair enough. Elephants are optically ugly. They're beautiful creatures. And I would argue that some of these other creatures are also beautiful in their own way. But many people would uh, find spiders, uh, scorpions, biting ants, um, stinging wasps, and uh, and, and snakes to be rather ugly creatures that they really wouldn't want in their agroforests. And yet, if you retain native forest trees in your agroforest and have high diversity agroforestry systems, unfortunately, all these animals and, uh, are part of that system. They are also biodiversity and they cause a lot of problems to farmers. They firstly, elephants cause direct damage to the infrastructure and they destroy the crops, they break through the um, the fences and and crush the coffee uh, bushes as this elephant is doing here. This is an elephant pictured in a coffee plantation. You can see the coffee bushes and they just walk straight through and destroy many of the coffee bushes. Of course, they're a direct danger to um, to human life. Uh, farmers are incredibly scared of elephants and 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 of course, if there are elephants nearby then they do everything they can to keep those elephants away. And elephants tend to prefer the more high diversity uh, systems where there's lots of native trees which they can feed on. Snakes, uh, ants, um, wasps, spiders are all things that are not uh, particularly attractive for uh, laborers working in these areas. And labor costs become very high. So a migrant laborer who comes to harvest the, the coffee crops um, uh, it's very labor intensive uh, during the harvesting period. The farmer has to employ lots of migrant labor and temporary labor. And that labor, those people who are providing that labor can charge much higher uh, um, salaries or, or demand much higher wages in, in, in biodiverse rich plantations simply because they don't want to work in those plantations. And the farmer has no option other than to pay them the higher wages, or there's a risk that they won't get the labor at all. And therefore, they lose their entire harvest because there's nobody to harvest the, the um, coffee when it, when it produces the berries in January. So these are real problems that farmers have to deal with. So finally, um, let's finish on the fourth point. What role can science play in overcoming these challenges? And I'll come back to policy and practice later. Um, well, firstly, we can ask how much biodiversity is needed. Is there an optimal amount of biodiversity that we can 
have, which avoids the, all the bad elements or some of the ugly factors, but still provides the benefits. Well, certainly our science seems to suggest that, that actually we don't need too much biodiversity. So 98% of coffee pollination is in, in this area is due to simply three common bee species. Um, and that alone improves coffee yields by 20%. The rest of the coffee um, product, uh, pollination is often by wind. Uh, but, but there's a substantial improvement of coffee yields by 20% just from these three bee species. So all we need to do is make sure that we provide an environment that's suitable to retain these three bee species. How much biodiversity is needed in terms of natural pest control? Well, it's as few as one or two specialist parasitoids that provide sufficient pet natural pest control to control the berry, um, the berry borer, which is a small beetle that destroys some of the crops. So long as we have these parasitoids, these one or two species of parasitoid, then that's an effective control. So again, that's not very much in terms of uh, biodiversity, in terms of species richness that we need to gain the benefits. And in terms of nutrient cycling, Micah's work showed that three, maybe four native species, tree species are sufficient to really improve right, nutrient cycling processes and soil fertility. So long as we have a mixture of three or four species providing leaf litter at different times of the year, then that dramatically improves nutrient cycling and soil fertility. These are not high numbers. So if so few species are sufficient to provide all these benefits of pollination, pest control and nutrient cycling, why do we need lots of biodiversity? So this is where we come back to that first slide that I showed you, which was about the different scales. Uh, and we need to recognize that it's not only the farm scale that we need to think about when we're talking about uh, retaining the benefits of biodiversity. So I'm just gonna give you one example here uh, because we don't have that much time. And I'm gonna to refer to the pollination aspects of here. I showed you three bee species that provide all the coffee pollination benefits, uh, tetragonula, uh, Apis serrana and Apis dorsata. They vary in size. Tetragonula is only about two or three millimeters um, long. Apis serrana is about seven or eight millimeters in body size. Apis dorsata is about 15 or 16 millimeters. It's called the giant a Asian giant honeybee. Now these operate at different scales and the, their population sizes are shaped by different scales. So whereas tetragonula responds to a very local scale, a fine scale of less than 100 meters, um, it, uh, and its response is very much in terms of local um, species richness of trees. So if we want to keep that a very important pollinator in the landscape, we need to make sure that at that fine scale, uh, there is a diversity of tree species present because it's not only coffee that is the pollen source. Coffee flowers only for three or four weeks in around about February, March, but to survive, it needs to um, secure pollen and nectar uh, from a whole variety of different tree species all the way through the year. So it, we need high tree and vegetation diversity at a fine scale to support this important pollinator uh, of coffee um, uh, when coffee indeed flowers in March. At the medium scale, Apis serrana responds to a broader landscape pattern. It needs to draw resources from a wider array uh, of tree species, and it also responds to different habitat patterns. So it needs a variety of different habitats to secure the range of uh, resources it needs. And similarly, Apis dorsata, it occurs in big nesting colonies. Then those nesting colonies are much more successful. You have large nest aggregates where there's a lot more forest cover and, and, and um, shaded uh, native shaded tree cover. And you can see that in the right-hand panel where the size of the red dot indicates the, that there's very small uh, nesting aggregates, a few colonies, uh, because it's, uh, it's a more open landscape. There are fewer uh, forest resources. But at this larger landscape scale, where there's lots of forest and lots of diverse agroforests, you get much larger colony sizes. Um, so again, it's a matter of looking across these different scales and recognizing that biodiversity has to be managed across multiple scales with many different species, simply to support these three very important pollinators. Finally, policy and practice. What role do they play in overcoming some of these challenges? I'm not going to dwell on this. We're kind of out of time but context is important. The image of the, the kind of uh, box at the bottom is the farm system, basically. Uh, but coffee farmers make decisions not based on, just on the farm system, but also on what the forest department is saying to them, what it allows them to do, the fines it imposes for, for cutting trees down illegally, 
the opportunity to sell native trees for timber and the permits it gets will shape its decision making. Um, the price of timber and the type of timber that's demanded and whether it's worth shifting to, to silver oak, which is the common name of Grevillea, or whether it's worth retaining native woodlands. Um, what the coffee board says and the kind of information they, they're getting from the, the coffee board about the value of coffee, the quality of the coffee, which varies under silver oak versus jungle wood, and a whole variety of many, many other things which I've not considered here. So the role of social, economic, and policy factors, as Martin indicated earlier, is absolutely crucial to be able to understand how to effectively embed biodiversity within effective management strategies. And I'll finish just with this last slide. How do we implement this change? Well, again, this is a, a farmer um, in the middle there who removed many of his native um, trees uh, when he was much younger. And you can and replace them with grevillea, which you can see in the background. It's grevillea. There's a few bananas there, and the rest is coffee. But in this um, image, we've been working with these farmers uh, for many years now, and we've been discussing with them how to effectively implement native trees back into these systems. And what he's showing, what he's got there, is a native uh, tree sapling that we provided for him some years ago now. And he's been nurturing it and shading it and, and providing it with just the optimal environment, shading it and protecting it from, from drought and from too much uh, heavy rainfall when the seedling, the sapling is vulnerable with these dried banana leaves. And he wanted to show us this uh, because he recognizes now that actually building back the ecological dimensions of an effective functioning agricultural system is, is increasingly recognized to be important. But to get to transfer this knowledge, to, to translate the scientific knowledge required lots of social engagement, lots of engagement with policymakers, with the coffee board. And slowly, slowly, we're building that knowledge and building that understanding so that farmers like this one here in, in this coffee estate are beginning to bring back many of those native uh, trees. So thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions in due course. Thank you very much, Jaburi, for this um, very interesting um, presentation and for bringing us to, to India and for um, sharing some insights on how much biodiversity that is needed within a given context. Without any further ado, Mariana, I um, would like to ask you to start sharing your screen and at the end we will open for questions. So please take the opportunity to write your question into the Q&A Art, and we will then transfer it to the speakers. Mariana, the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, uh, for inviting me to this uh, lecture dedicated to biodiversity. So I am Mariana Fenzi. I'm a research fellow at the IPFL and uh, at UNIL in Lausanne. Combining uh, archival uh, and um, ethno, um, ethnographic and uh, ethnobotanic work, uh, my research is, uh, is uh, focused on, on the narratives on the Green Revolution, so on the narratives on, uh, of, of, um, of agricultural modernization, and I also work on farmers' management of crop diversity. But I would like to start, so you will see directly, <laughs> what is my 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 work and uh, so today i i will talk about uh, a kind of biodiversity so that the diversity that exists on farmers fields and that constitutes our our food and uh, crop diversity is not only the number of species that we eat, but and unfortunately there are not many varieties that we eat, but it's also the diversity that we can find in the same variety. So the genetic diversity inside a single population of, of mice in one field, like this Tuxpeño uh, maize uh, from Mexico, where you can find different colors, different shapes and uh, the same in the chalkenio variety uh also from Mexico, uh, which is uh, here, it's used to, to make uh, this uh, necklace. And uh, for example, for beans, we in the, in the same uh, variety, we can have different colors, shapes, and, and so on. 
But uh, starting in the 50s and then especially in the 70s with what we call the Green Revolution, modern homogeneous varieties have been adopted in many places by farmers replacing land races. But let's get back a little bit uh, to the beginning of this process, because farmer choices are rooted in historical, social, political dynamics. In 1957, a food and agriculture organization was leading the World Seed Campaign together with, uh, with Association of Plant Breeders. And this campaign was following uh, the very spirit of, uh, of the Green Revolution. In, um, I, at, uh, at the FAO archives, I found, uh, for example, this picture and the legend said, we can learn at every age what good seeds are. So actually this advertisement was uh, targeting uh, traditional farmers and also old farmers. In another one from the same archive, uh, we can see a, a farmer the, who is represented as the goodness of, of, fortune, of fortune. So he's blind and with a, a cornucopia. So the, the message is that he can trust blindly the seed that, uh, that he is using because these, uh, these seeds are from, um, from uh, uh, from uh, com so our commercial seeds that are supposed to be uh, very, very productive. Um, but uh so uh, that uh, a little bit later in the 60s, some plant breeders and scientists involved in, uh, in FAO breeding programs around the world got worried about the loss of crop diversity as a consequence of this replacement uh, dynamic. So they were highlighting that, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, homogeneous varieties, they were replacing and threatening somehow the limited, what, what was considered a limited stock, a limited reserve of, of, of diversity of genes. And uh, uh, in the 1967, at the technical conference uh, uh, on the exploration, utilization, and conservation of plant genetic resources, the term of genetic erosion was used for the first time. So, Plant breeders uh, raised the, the alarm about this urgent pro uh, problem in, in their reports, and they were claiming that plant breeding is a powerful single weapon and that the replacement of indigenous varieties were happening in a very uh, fast way. So, but the rational that uh, structured the conservation efforts was framed accordingly to the concept of genetic erosion. This, uh, in my opinion, means uh, three, uh, three, uh, uh, three important things. That the first one is that uh, uh, we have a clear phenomenon that primitive varieties, so old varieties, farmer varieties, varieties that are not updated, varieties that are not so efficient, would be replaced by modern commercial ones, effective, more effective one, including in the center of origin of, of cultivated plants. And the second point is that the victims of uh, this varietal uh, homogenization are breeders because uh, farmers, they will be uh, fully satisfied with the variety that breeders are able to release to them. And the third point that farmers uh, in this framework, they don't have an active role in conserving and contributing to the evolution of crop diversity. So the conservation ex situ uh, was uh, was the obvious approach in in this in this uh, in this framework, and the breeders there there they had so the, the responsibility to collect varieties and to store these varieties in in the green revolution centers where they were also working to 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 
to, to, to build new, new uh, varieties. So at um, at um, at the, the the problem of the of the erosion of genetic resources was included on the global environmental agenda at the United Station uh, the, the United Nations Conference of uh, on the Human Environment held in Stockholm in June uh, 1972. So the Stockholm conference finally made it possible to establish a network of gene banks located inside the center um, that were created so before to perpetuate the efforts of the Green Revolution. And so the aim of this center was to collect genetic materials and store so varieties of seeds and store it for long term conservation to basically to satisfy the needs of plant breeders. And uh, so you can see, for example, different centers specialized on, on different uh, um, species. And uh, at that time, uh, two main approaches were competing. Ex situ conservation, uh, um, which was focused on conserving so genetic material, and in situ conservation, on on-farm conservation, um, which was uh, targeting the process, so the, the environment, uh, who, uh, which contain this diversity. Somehow, uh, still, these two uh, main approaches are uh, somehow competing still today. So we can consider, we can still find approaches uh, which consider genetic resources as a stock of information to exploit or as a more evolutional and ecological process. So the goal of conservation also changes because you can, in, in, in um, in one case, you can conserve, so you are, uh, the goal is to conserve genes or evolutionary process. And the modality, the, the way to conserve can be in gene banks, where you are working on, for example, on germoplasma database, or you are working on maybe also with gene banks, but also studying ecosystems. And uh, the, the actors, uh, uh, who are involved in, in these different ways can differ. So you can have uh, in a centralized approach, breeders are working in research centers where they are working on varieties that, uh, that then uh, uh, that will be released to farmers. And in a participatory approach, uh, plant breeders, they work together with farmers, not only in, uh, in uh, experimental station, but also in, field, uh, in, in, in their fields to, uh, to, uh, to, to develop varieties that uh, are uh, suitable for farmers' needs and, uh, and, for, uh, and, for their, and according to their preferences. So farmers uh, can uh, use the use land races for several reasons. Of course, so for cultural and gastronomic ones. So here you can see in Mexico a lot of, of recipes with maize uh, from the, the most common one. So from tortillas, uh, tostadas, but you can also use maize and special varieties to make uh, drinks or special foods, including for rituals. But land races are also uh, are, are, are also uh, conserved and, uh, and farmers uh, keep growing land races uh, because they are adapted to limiting uh, condition. They can play an important role to address climate change and they are key elements in low input uh, agriculture. So when we studied the distribution of uh, maize varieties uh, in Yucatan, in, in Mexico, we realized that uh, farmers, they were using land races for, the, for their stony soils, which represent the, 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 the most of, of the soils in Yucatan. And they were using hybrids, uh, mainly on homogeneous uh, soils. 
And uh, in, the, in this same community, we also analyzed the, the dynamic of seed diversity over three years. And in the spring 2012, uh, you uh, unusually high participation precipitations sorry occurred you can see the, the red peak and this forced uh, farmers to reduce the cultivated area this happened because they couldn't clean properly their their fields um, so they reduced the cultivated area as shown in the first panel in in red as a consequence, mice diversity in the farmer's plot was also reduced in 2000, 2012. And, uh, but however, farmers were able to recover and restore the diversity usually cultivated in the community in the year following the, the critical climate event in, in blue. So to understand how we analyze the seed flow transaction, so the transaction uh, of seeds lots, and uh, um, in, inside the, the community and outside. So here you can see that the sites, uh, the sites of the dots uh, corresponds to the amount of, the, of seeds exchanged. And the arrows indicate the direction of the transactions. So we found that in 2012, they in, in red, they barely exchanged seeds, except with, uh, so, so they didn't exchange too much inside the, the main community and they exchanged a little bit uh, with, uh, with the community, uh, uh, with the closest communities. But they reactivated their network in 2013 to recover the diversity. Here you can see inside the main community um, the transaction. So farmers giving seeds to other farmers. And you can including notice that there are farmers that are more active than others, the colored uh, ones. So I would like to, high, to highlight that the diversity was restored through a kind of community resilience where each farmer is specialized in a particular land race. And the conservation of crop diversity, in my opinion, can be understood, uh, understood as a social event. So this... Uh, highlights the importance of the community level in, in conservation of crop diversity and uh, that the fact that in many communities, not only in Mexico, but in general in the global south, resilience for seed conservation works for, still works for the major crops. Um, so there are, of course, uh, a lot of broad research questions that we need to, to, to address. For example, uh, in this case, how many years of destabilizing events they can endure? And how can social networks, uh, including movements, policymakers, academics, can support the ability of farmers to find the seeds that they need? And which role for, uh, for seed banks? and in, in conserving biodiversity, not only for breeders' needs, but also for farmers' needs. And how so we can develop a simple local information system, which allows farmers to find the varieties that uh, uh, they need. So if we have, uh, um, uh, if I have a few minutes more, I would like, uh, I, I guess, I would like uh, uh, to tell you something uh, from my personal experience. And I, I have not, I mean, the presumption that this is an example of what we should do or uh, that is an important example, but it's just something that shows that sometimes farmers need seeds that can be easily found. When I was in Mexico in 2013, I realized that farmers in, uh, in, in the community where I was working uh, lost the local bean seeds. At that time, I was hosted by the CC, uh, the, uh, which is a research center and which has uh, its uh, own gene bank. However, they were not able to help because they had very little amount of seeds and they were not working with farmers yet. 
So, but in this period, I was collecting specimens in markets, in villages, and a few weeks before, uh, I, I met by chance uh, in a seed diversity fair, a farmer who was uh, selling a lot of bean seeds, including the varieties that farmers in my village lost. So I explained uh, to, to him uh, the, our problem and he agreed to, to come. I bought, uh, so I bought all seeds that he could sell and we distributed the seeds to farmers. So the cost of this operation was around $100, 50 for the taxi and just 50 for the seeds. So in my, in my conclusion, I would like to say that uh, I mean, to support uh, uh, dynamic conservation strategies, first of all, we have to understand the farmers' management of agrobiodiversity, especially during challenging events. And, uh, and, uh, and then we can promote a more tailored and, and, and support so them with, uh, to deal with the local crisis. And we also need to help seed system networks through combination of conservation and breeding approaches, including creating a partnership with long-term conservation efforts. So those uh, who are uh, uh, who uh, ex to gene banks can can provide. So uh, to enhance uh, in a way that we can so enhance crop diversity in a way that is consistent with different farmer production and with different environments. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Marianna, for sharing your experience and some personal stories also. <laughs> yeah, sorry for that. <laughs> no. Uh, in contrary, thank you very much for this. This is what we hope to also share. Besides all scientific facts and evidence, often it's also about that what happens between you gather information and knowledge and what ends up in publications too. So that's very valuable as well. Thank you also, Javuri. I have a few questions here. One question was on, on whether or not we share the powerpoints that's something we have to check with the speakers and if so we could upload them on our website but um, you will see that when you just revisit our website there where possible we can share these presentations of course there is um there are a few questions maybe focus on on two one is um on both for both of the speakers is a question about definition so if um, that person reflects on the presentation and asks whether or not it's correct to say that the scale of analysis is what determines the definition of what agrobiodiversity is. So the smaller or the more focused the scope, it's different what agrobiodiversity is versus if you look at landscape level or who wants to maybe Mariana starts and then handing over to Jaburi. Yeah, if you want, I I I believe it that Jaburi would be. Uh, I mean, his reply could be much more interesting than mine. But I can just say that I mean the the, the question of scale is uh, is is extremely is is extremely important. So in in the case of uh, of seeds, for example, we can see that uh, I mean seeds are shared among communities and that are Actually, including uh, including uh, modern varieties, so varieties coming from uh, very far, they can be uh, they can be uh, adapted to local to local uh, to local landscape. So maybe I don't know if it is a way to to to, to reply, but in our in in both, I mean, I, I didn't show in this presentation the creolization aspects, but I guess that in both. Uh, um, both presentation, we can see that uh, actually, I mean, we cannot uh, uh, reasoning just in terms of native and uh, and uh, and uh, and not native varieties, but actually we can do we can help. Uh, 
the agroecosystems with uh, also with species that maybe are not native that i mean that we need really to think in uh, in uh, uh, with an open mind and uh, and uh, that uh, so these uh, these different level they can also play uh, and uh, and have a benefit as uh, in, uh, in uh, i mean i didn't show this in my presentation but i was so fascinated by but i i i have to say something similar in maize and i, I was so fascinated by gibber uh, presentation so i i'll i stop here thank you it's about different perspectives and that's why i think it's wise to listen to both of you you focusing more on also the human interactions and now we are very curious to hear what Jaburi from an ecological or forest ecological perspective would share. Yeah I mean I completely agree from a speaking as an ecologist I mean what is ecology? Ecology is um, the understanding of the science of the interactions between um, biotic and abiotic elements in systems however whatever scale you look at your system. But I think in ecology, what we've come to realize for a long time now is that um, it's a multi-scalar uh, issue. There are feedbacks and processes that interact across scales. So what happens at, at one scale is affected and affects things and processes and outcomes at other scales through these ecological processes. So if we, if you accept that, if you, and I think there's a ton of evidence to support that, um, that ecology is a very multidimensional, multiscalar um, topic, then if you also accept that agroecology is the application of ecological principles to agricultural systems and practices, as I defined it, then that implicitly recognizes the role of scale um, in, in agroecology and the importance of scale in considering scale in agroecology. And I think the mistake that has um, happened in the past, and certainly not not anymore, but um, you know maybe in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, a lot of emphasis was placed upon managing farm systems. The whole um, consultative group on agricultural um, research um, was all about improving yields, improving um, farmer farm performance, very much focused at the farm scale. Uh, and I think that brought huge benefits and huge advantages and certainly improved yields and so on. But it did also lead to a lot of problems because the broader scale issues had not been considered. And that has created many of the environmental and landscape scale problems that we face now, including long term soil degradation, including the accumulation of pests and diseases, the increased use of pesticides and to support these high yields and so on. So I think it is important to think in a very multi-dimensional way, in a very inter, uh, multi-scalar way as well, when we think about agroecology. Thank you very much. Um, two things, one, uh, a lot of um, people asking questions also link it to, uh, thank you to both of you for great presentations. I don't want to um, not share that with you. One question is on the adoption, uh, Jaburi. The challenge of raising awareness, encouraging adoption for agroforestry or agroecological practices at the farm level. Have you uh, assessed different types of interventions? Um, what is the reason why farmers would adopt? So that's, uh, that's yeah, I mean, certainly our research addresses that. It is really tough. Um, I mean, the simple issue is that there are major barriers for adopting agroforestry or agroecological practices by farmers. Um, we can sit in our um, offices and our universities and our research institutes and do lots of work which suggests, um, provides lots of evidence to say why farmers should adopt agroecological principles, why they should integrate trees in their um, agricultural systems, um, why they should promote biodiversity. And all of that, from a scientific perspective, makes perfect sense, particularly when you read it in published papers and so on. But when you take those ideas and talk to farmers about them, they raise a whole lot of issues which undermine the validity of many of these arguments. So what I often argue for, and, and that's why we're doing lots of systems level science, what I argue for is that it's not enough just to look at the ecology. Ecologists need to understand the economic constraints in which farmers are working. 
the the policy processes that lead farmers to make decisions or or in whichever way they go the um, broader social context within which uh, farmers work, their cultural backgrounds, the, the traditions in which they're working, all of this is really important to understand. And only then, once we understand all these different dimensions, can we have really sensible conversations with farmers about what they might be doing to improve their farming systems and perhaps what they should not be doing. But if you only come with ecological information, you're not going to get very far. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, time is running faster than we wish. There are a few more questions. One question, Mariana, very with a request for a very short answer, and then we will figure out whether or not we are able to transfer some questions to you to be answered at another stage, but that's for later. I won't promise it now, but maybe we can find a solution. But one short last question to you, Mariana. What happened after 2013 uh, in the region of Yucatan? That has been a very important year, 2013. The question was, what happened after this? After? Yes. Uh, in, uh, sorry, so in, uh, in uh, I don't understand exactly the, the, the question. So they, I mean, I, I was there until 2014, so I can, uh, I can just uh, be sure about my reply for 2014. But I mean, they are, uh, they, they are still cultivating in this way and uh, and but i am not sure if i understood exactly I, the question so maybe we can uh, we can uh, we can exchange with the person i i don't know okay let's do it like that i i think the question was what did 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 the thing move on but let's let's try to to connect in a written form then with the with the um, in that sense, okay, yeah. um, I guess we close here. I want to thank the visitors, the guests, the public audience on Zoom for being with us, but very much also you two for sharing your work, your learnings, and for being open to these questions and for sharing these, these interesting stories with us. Um, thank you very much. Um, for the public, this lecture is now over. And I would um, invite you both to stay with us. Let's say we make five minutes break and then we open up for questions from the students. Is that fine with you? Absolutely. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Have a lovely evening out of ETH.